How, how many how many people work in the in in your Gips and in, in your Murphy lab now? We have a crew, including our hardware aging guys, of ten people. Ten. Uh, and, and, and and regarding that, I mean, we uh, we're, we weren't hesitant to talk about the number, but we just wanted to uh, get to a point with the product, as hopefully we have, with people's. Uh, 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 acceptance of the product right. and so to know that other people are working with me is no big mystery you right. know sure uh, but you can imagine early on that we couldn't brag about how many guys were touching the guitars sure. with Murphy's name on it uh, I brought the process and the product to Gibson right we had a sizable number of back orders for Murphy Aged. Right. And as we all know, Murphy Aged was Tom taking a brand new guitar and simulating weather checking in the finish, some distressing, and that sufficed for a lot of years as the way you make, take a Gibson historic instrument and add right. age to it. Well, the new people uh, Cesar is a friend of mine and a, uh, an associate. He approached me early on as coming on board, and he knew who I was. And I was glad to be recognized, but I'd already established my lifestyle. I worked by myself in my shop and come to Gibson occasionally. Right. And then I moved down here, so I'd be here once a week. And so... Uh, I'm sure he was somewhat pressed to find out why, whoever this Tom Murphy guy is, why, why does he not work here? Right. And we have 400 guitars on back order. So I understood his uh, uh, his needing me to uh, cooperate to address that issue. But a, a, a lengthy meeting had me sort of concerned that things were going to turn upside down. Right. But I had already used my new process on in restoration. Right. And I I was blown away by it. I mean, each time, I'm, wow. I'm thinking, thank you, thank you, yeah. wherever this came from. Right. And uh, obviously, I can't tell the whole story about sure. the material, but the material is a key to, to the product. And so the next time we met to discuss my employment, I introduced him to this. Right. I, went, that, that, I always say that's the future. Right. And I could see it clearly, and I was confident enough having executed it that I thought. Mm -hmm. And then how, how, do, how, do you, how do they vet, do they take people from yeah. the normal team? So, so what this is, is me, discovering the and the use of the product and process and then then the word lab was used not immediately but pretty quickly regarding a change of materials and i knew that i would have to have a team of people to be able to address cuz you're you're still looking at back orders for Murphy aged, right. at some point that's going to change to whatever this ends up being called. Right. Well, the, the lab is a specific area in custom shop. And I say this frequently that the concept of what we do, that sort of falls under the lab heading. Okay. And then the product, when you hold it up, that's Murphy Lab. Right. So, it was easy to to move away from Murphy Aged. Uh, so now, early early on, when someone would say, "Are you are you doing this?" they'd be actually holding an instrument. Do you like it? <laughs> it's awesome. Okay, no more questions. Right. Meaning, well, let's don't get into the specific of if I'm doing it or not. You wouldn't be having it if I hadn't done it. 
And right. so I oversee it, supervise it. I'm involved in it. I personally do prototypes and uh, whatever more specifically I need to be involved in. At the Greenies, I did all the, all the Brazilians uh, to get that off the ground the way we did it. Right. And, uh, and in terms of uh, marketing and, you know, and, uh, but now if you take, talk, talk about the Indian board greenies and an open order book, I can't, I can't do 200 greenies and right. get anything else done. So what happens is as we started having, they had in-house, there was in-house aging. I was not involved in that. Yes. They sort of drifted into that at Gibson. I can't tell you what years, but I, I offered to train or work with, and they never took me up on it. I would, I interacted with them some, because I'd stay two or three days at a time on Joe Perry project or Joe Walsh project, or, you know, and we we would do it together in there. But uh, I, I never wanted an assistant to be doing my, my actual work. Right. And, uh, but in this case, I needed people with some some uh, understanding of why or what and what we were doing. We, we don't just bang on guitars with car keys and railroad spikes, and those are our tools. But why it, are dental tools? Or, yeah, yeah, that's right. And <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> the guys that were already in house, so there were about four of them, doing my old technique mm -hmm. for uh, certain orders, and you know and it was called in-house, we all became a team. Right. So early on, I had a little talk and said, guys, just, you got to roll with me. I got only one way to show you this, and I'm really picky about it, and we're going to do this together. And it, immediately, there was a pride thing in not just being able to say you work in the Murphy lab, but no one then at that time and no one now inside the lab takes any of it for granted. Right. Uh, I'm not saying they leave work every day with tons of pride and satisfaction, but they don't take it lightly. Uh, there's not a weak link in there. It's like, uh, there are certain guys who just ha ha happen to have a knack for a certain part of neck wear, for instance. Uh, but imagine going in there and them handing you a railroad spike and car keys and these hammers we use and some funky tools and a heat gun. And you're going, <laughs> what am I supposed to do? Well, if you don't have some sort of reference in your mind of what the results are going to be, it's going to be tough. And so those guys already had that because they've been trying to make guitars look authentic in their in-house function. But we're taking it to a whole nother level. Right. And so fortunately, put the razor blade down, and now let's hone our, the craft of distressing guitars. So I engineered the four levels and what it would take and make templates, say, for the belt wear or whatever. And we all did it together. Right. And we all saw it slowly take shape and I'm talking I'm doing R&D and I'm getting guitars with checking and, and we're all gathering around going look at this yeah the first ES body that I did and I got vertical checking what like, oh my gosh yeah. not only is this cool it's really consistent with what we see so the conditions that we subject the guitars to it's just like it's just like a real guitar. So, uh, anyway, I tell the guys every chance I get, thank you for, you know, committing and and trying to understand what we're what we're doing because our guitars are expensive. People have expectations. Uh, they're not the cheapest guitars, but they're way cheaper than if you were the, yeah. the original. There are a lot of pro did. players playing our guitars. <clears throat> And regular Gibson Historics, yeah, in place of their original instruments. And I'll I will say, 
I have a really old guitar that I bought in the 70s and it was almost $1,000 and now it's way more expensive than that. But even at 3000 when it was like, and I was playing on the road, I was worried about that guitar. If something happens, there is no re replacement for this. Right. Let's say an original one. No one makes a guitar that feels or plays or sounds like this. They might be shaped like this. Same with the Les Paul. And now, I, I, I don't know how much better our historic product could be as in terms of a reference to the originals. Uh, you know, uh, they're they're really great. So our little thing that we add, it's just like icing on the cake, you know. And if we didn't have the quality and cool instruments we have, that wouldn't mean the same. I've had other companies try to recruit me to do their guitars. Sure. It's like, no, what I do, I've never seen on your guitar. Right. You know. So it's it's. I'm very 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 lucky to work at Gibson and then to do what I do too. Uh, it's been a crazy long roller coaster journey, but now I come to work every day at Gibson. I'm sitting in front of Billy's Marshall when you're 19. Yeah, getting right, blasted. Right. Getting well, blasted. imagine that, man. <laughs> I, I, it didn't occur to me until what, once I was actually working on Pearly Gates. It's like I saw that guitar and now I'm working on a, a replica. Not to mention all the other famous guitars. Couple. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I, I don't take for granted either. I got a really cool job. Yeah. And uh, so, but I want consumers to be happy. And I, I get a lot of compliments. And I saw a guy buy a Brazilian Les Paul last Saturday. I walked into our garage and he was buying the guitar at that moment. And they brought him over so he could meet me and I signed his booklet. And he said he just really enjoyed the guitar and he was buying it before he ever met me. Right. And uh, that's just sort of a really cool thing that comes together. Because like I said, and we, we talk about back there, if we were going to compromise, we go, eh, it's good enough for today. No, no, no. Someone's going to put the same money on that guitar as, as you, they did on the one you really, really took care of. So we, we're all conscious of that all the time. And uh, I mean, because you have to face your customers and say, we, you know, you have this product and it's cool and, and hopefully they have a passion for it and then they pay for it. That's what makes the world go around. Yeah, I mean, m guitar players are pretty educated today with with social media and YouTube. So mm -hmm. most most folks that come in know about Murphy Lab. But every now and then, you'll just see their neck will be angled, and they'll be going, "Are these all vintage guitars?" And then we get to tell the story. And I'm like, "Like, here's a, Travis pulled this out. This is we do a, a double gold chamber uh -huh. 56. Jim, Jimmy Vivino just bought one from us, and it it looks." Incredible in person. This is obviously not finished. It's in a, Travis bought it from the line, but uh -huh. we love it. So the gold top, just by the time it gets to us, it, it, it looks like a real guitar. You know, it looks like a vintage guitar. So definitely a real guitar. So yeah, uh, I mean, honestly, every single day because I inspect the guitars in the morning yeah. that were done the day and night before, and and very frequently I go. Who did this? Yeah. And I'll walk up to the guy that did it yeah. and go, and we're, we all look and go, wow, how did that happen? And uh, so it, it's cool to see one of our processes is really, really important part of the concept. And then their craft adds to it. And th they do their work mm -hmm. before the guitars are checked. And it's, Yes, yeah. crazy to see it all come come together. So the colors of the guitars, like the other day, the Brazilian the guy had, the top was killer, the burst was killer, the feel was killer, the aging was just perfect. Right. And uh, and it, I was glad that that's how I felt about it while I was looking at it. I didn't have any questions. But uh, once again, 
Uh, well, early on, someone handed me a heavy aged at, at our garage, mm -hmm. and I went, they took it out of the case and went, yep, heavy aged. They go, how can you tell? Because we do them every day. Yeah. And I know what they look like because they look like this right. in terms of the elements of the, right. of the aging. So uh, I'm just trying to take care of it, keep yeah. it going. And, and thanks to you guys for being no, proud, proud to be proud to be able to carry them and, and uh, represent them. And awesome. And you and I met yeah. many years ago. We, we did. So this is the ultralight. Yeah, there you go. So uh, without that, it would just be a blue guitar. Right. And uh, it's really cool. Uh, and so I'll see this on a rack in the morning and I'll go, okay, wow. Now, if this wasn't here and this, just this, I, w I wouldn't accept it. Ha we know how it happens, but we can't totally control it either. Yeah. So I said in response to this one customer, uh, I don't have a minimum number of lines that have to be there, but the whole effect has to be there. Well, you're never going to please everybody, so you got to do what you can sleep at night and feel comfortable I, I try to, with. I try and, to please and, myself. And it's... That, that's just with and any aging guitars, and so it's... I it, was... Uh, I mean, how many people really can touch or, or play or own a real burst? No, you know, I've, right. I've been lucky to touch a, you know touch 10 of them in my lifetime, but you know, I'm not not in a position to, 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 to be in the cool club to own one. And yeah, so, I've owned two, and, and uh, yeah. each one was just a pile of money. Right. Unfortunately... And I know where to get really, really good, cool guitars. So, right. Uh, and when I was asked on the second one, why did you not keep that? I go, where, where would I keep a yeah. quarter million dollars? You're right. <laughs> In a guitar case? Right. But anyway, uh, that's what's cool about our guitars today is they will function perfectly fine as an alternative to an original. And once again, the company <clears throat> committing to someone shook my hand in 1993 in Anaheim when I took the first historic out there he'd been with the company a long time very respected a good guy good engineer and designer and he shook my hand and said that's what I wanted to do in 1982 and they and he did but they didn't do it and I have somewhere in my file a intercompany memo that was in a filing cabinet that I just drug over to use and I was clearing it out. And it's intercompany to two employees at Gibson talking about the Nippon company making a request and as you thumb through it, back here's a drawing of a Les Paul with arrows pointing to certain features of it that they wanted right. in Japan. And essentially, it was a 59 Les Paul. Yeah. With the company in this memo discussed, should we do this? This is what they want. And yeah. I guess at NAM they had made a request. So that was the company being old. And so fast forward to 1992 when I was in a meeting and said, you know, if we would, with the guys going, like what? What should we do? Oh, wow. Let's see, where should I start? And then we had a me meeting a week later where they said, come next week. And this was just on a notebook paper. Headstock, serial number, neck profile. Meaning, right. I'm not luthier, but there's a bunch of things that if you do, that would be cool. Right. And the guitar can be like five grand if you do that. What? A replica of a 59 Les Paul? Yeah. And at that time, I'm... That original was like 75 grand. Timing was right, stars lined up, and they went, let's do it. And that's, what's, that's where it started. Yeah. And here we are. Are we 30 years later? The company is at more committed to it. And we know why, because it sells and it's good. Yeah, they're cool. Uh, and so that's why I'm so lucky to be to have been able to be attached to it and watch it. Even when I wasn't employed by the company, I was involved with the guitars. Right. So, like I said, you and I met many, many years yeah. ago. Yeah. Was it at Jimmy's show? Was it yeah. in Dallas? Yeah. Yeah. 
maybe not the time I, I traded you a tube screamer for a Marshall cabinet, but <laughs> <laughs> who uh, won on that deal? Oh, I, I think we know who won. Yeah. <laughs> At the time, I was driving home going, damn, Marshall cabinet for a pedal. Yeah. Just for a little pedal. Yeah. Uh, but for you to stay in the culture and in the business is cool. It's been a fun journey. So glad you know to, that when, glad when, to be here. When I moved to Houston in '69, and I had bought a '52 P base for a hundred bucks in Illinois a week after I saw Vanilla Fudge, and Tim Boger was playing a bass with a Telecaster headstock. Yep. And I walked into this little music store. They'd moved rock instruments from a piano store in the town next to our town, yeah. and they had a thing called the Rock, and that they had drums, electric guitars. And I walked in there, and here's the bass hanging on the wall for a hundred bucks. Yeah, I want that. And I bought that, and I put it in a duffel bag with my clothes when I moved to Houston. Uh, I rode the bus, uh, right. the Greyhound, all the way to Houston, and got to Houston. Had that bass, and my girlfriend's little brother had a friend. He wanted to borrow it. I go, okay. So that was probably in January of '70. Right. I went back to Illinois in May that year just to go visit or something. Hey, can I get my bass back? And we go to this kid's house and he brings out the 52P bass. It's still there. Right. That summer I traded that bass and $30 for an SG Junior to a guy because Live at Leeds was out. Right. And I, I just want an SG of some kind. And I guess that's where it really started yeah. back then. Uh, but I thought Houston was the only place that people liked old guitars. Right. Be just because they were there. and But it had happened in Dallas, obviously. You hear about, um, you know, there were vintage dealers that would show up and, and all out through out Texas to uh, big shows and bring guitars backstage for rock stars to choose from. So that mm -hmm. happened in Houston and Dallas a lot. So. Yeah, yeah. I found that out later, obviously. See, because I didn't know that Jimmy Vaughn was actually from Dallas. Right. All I knew about his, well, his Austin right. you know, connection, because I saw Texas Storm one time in Houston, uh, and he was playing guitar for that, for them. And he, he, he was walking through after their set. His, he had long hair. Wrap around sunglasses, a leather jacket. Look cool, huh? Khaki pants. <laughs> I go, are you Jimmy? He goes, yeah, man. <laughs> goes, and it had, he had mailbox letters on his strat. Yeah. But uh, then the, obviously I got the interview. I moved to Dallas for a little while too. And uh, I would say probably that culture, the guitar culture started in Dallas probably as much or more than Houston really. Yeah. But uh, Gibbons was in Houston, and Bart and uh, uh, David Wentz, who he became, he came, became Robin guitar, right? Uh, and had, they had the pickups, and Bart opened the store. Uh, and Rio Grande, uh -huh. Rio Rio Grande, pickups. Rio Grande pickups in, inside uh, Rock and Robin. But the guitar, the Les Paul that got broken in California. Uh, I left the Telecaster when I left California. I just right. left it with the band. You guys can have it. And moved to Houston, and uh, back to Houston, and the girl and I that had been on and off for several years uh, sort of gave me an ultimatum. Are we getting married or what's happening here? Uh, she had already been to San Marcos, I think, to school for a little bit. And uh, I think I said, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and which caused me at that time to need to start saving money to buy a vehicle. I didn't even own a car. And uh, that lasted like two or three days. And she sat me down and went, we're not getting married. Yeah, You need to get a life and I'm going back to school. But I had $300 saved up toward getting ready to think about buying a little truck or something. And I told her brother, give me a ride downtown. And I went right to Bart's house. Uh -huh. And they had guitars in their living room. Just, you can have that Strat or that Les Paul for 300. And so I bought a, a one of those 70s P90 wraparound bridge, small headstock, gold top Les Paul, instead of a car. <laughs> and SG Junior, gold top, single. Yes, <laughs> yeah, single. <laughs> yeah. Uh, <laughs> And uh, moved to Colorado in 70, 
four just bumming around and uh, uh, somehow I got a couple other guitars. I had a D18 and then I had a 74 telly and in that town, Fort Collins, Colorado, people in Houston had started calling me a guitar player. I mean, they go, oh, you're the guitar player. And I start thinking, oh, I guess I'm a guitar player. Yeah. And uh, I remember sending my mom a picture of me and my D18 and some Les Paul and a Telecaster and some national guitar behind me and said, it's me and the kids. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and so I was at a wedding for a I was there for a wedding in Phoenix in 78 and driving down the street before the wedding, there's a guitar store. Hey, let me go in there. Went in and these, the store has been pretty famous. I won't say the name, but he had dowel rods stuck on the wall and guitars stacked on top of each other wow. all around the room. And I wanted a Telecaster with a black pit guard. I pulled a strat off the wall and there was a black pet. 53 telly. How much is this? $950? Yeah. Wow. Wow. I went home to Colorado, called a couple noted dealers, and said they want $950. Is that good? And they go, we don't know. We can't see the guitar. I said, well, do you have one? Yeah. We have two of them. One's a 52, one's a 53, one's 1,200, and one's 1,000. So I went to a bank and borrowed $950 against my 67 Dodge van. And the banker asked me, what guitar is worth $950? Oh, old guitars, they, they, they can be expensive. And he had pictures of Model T's and Model A's on his wall. He was a collector. He collected those old cars. He got it. He got it. Yeah. Sent the money down there, and one day they, they shipped it, and it was Denver Airport. I picked it up, went to a gig, plugged it in, went, Oh, wow. Yeah. Everything changed then. So awesome. I still have that guitar today. Very cool. And uh, so uh, then the rest, you know, just finding out other guys were into old guitars and hearing about guitars and going to pawn shops. It just fell right in line. Uh, my brother knows more about guns than I know about guitars. And he is obsessed and always has been. But he loves guns. Right. He loves looking at them, seeing them, feeling them, shooting them. Uh, and you think I talk a lot. You get him <laughs> talking about guns. So, right. uh, it, yeah. And, and your family. father had the, the wood shop up in Illinois, right? He, well, he's a wood teacher. He yeah. taught shop. Right. And he had his own wood shop. So when I moved there in 94, he said, can't you use my place to do your thing? And uh, I, I've said this many times. I said, what's my thing? Well, <laughs> uh, I had pursued music. Right. Uh, I had some success. I played here in town. I rode around in, in a bus right. with a nationally known act, a couple of them, and saw what that was all about. And one of those gigs, both gigs sort of ended abruptly in different ways. And I was offered a job at Gibson, and wow, I've applied there like four times and they never called me. But inside the walls, I acted a little bit different than the average person uh, because of my, and then I got a reputation. Right. What do you do at a guitar show? Because I'd be leaving to go to Dallas. Right. Well, you just do guitars for a weekend, you know. And uh, so to be asked to be in that meeting was really cool. I didn't know that was going to happen. but. Uh, but just in life, every once in a while, there's a signal that you need to pay attention to. I was still unclear of what I was doing or where I was going to be, because I thought, well, I work at Gibson. I don't want to quit playing music. Well, it's not like that. You don't have to quit playing music. Right. Just, you know, take a day job. And uh, so then cool stuff that happened to me at Gibson seemed to be it right. until one day I was told I didn't work there anymore. Now what? Jeez. Yeah. <laughs> well, that was very traumatic. Yeah. But what happened was it caused me to go to Illinois. It caused me to have to figure out a way to do what I was supposed to do. 
and I, I've said this many times, I don't think on an interview, that at the beginning of a movie we were watching on TV, it said the two most important days of a person's life are the day they are born and the day they realize why. And that was a quote from Mark Twain. Wow. I don't know what the movie was. I have no idea, but it struck me that I wish I knew. And one day I go, Tom, wake up. Yeah. You know why you're here. <laughs> People are telling you why you're here. Right. It was very clear. So I just sort of relaxed and did it. And I was able to work every day knowing that somebody wanted me to do what I did. Right. I w for a while I was going, you realize I'm just winging it here. But I winged it pretty good, I guess. And uh, But I, I got committed and dedicated to it and paid attention and took my whole involvement and my life really serious. And then I met all you guys and then here we've all been doing it. And uh, how much better can it be? You know, just lingering at guitar shops our whole life. So, yeah, yeah. So uh, I've made guitar be a living for sure. Yeah, absolutely. And, and what's weird is when I was here, I was trying to network like everybody else. It's before the internet, so business cards. You try to get gigs, and sometimes that's really a drag. And some of the gigs are a drag. Right. And so uh, then. When I moved to Illinois, I literally got phone calls from a lot of people. What's up, man? What are you, what are you doing? And the, one day one guy goes, man, everybody's asking about you. I go, who? <laughs> he goes, you know, just players around town. I go, who? They never called me when I was there. Right. And now they want to know about where I'm at. And uh, not to mention, who wouldn't want to meet celebrities, right? And then all of a sudden some celebrities found out about me. And I shouldn't say this, but I've been fortunate to meet many. And I actually have phone numbers in my phone that if I see that's who it is, I, I don't take the call. <laughs> <laughs> you, you pocket dialed me one time. I'm like, I've made it in MI. <laughs> pocket dial from Tom Murphy. Uh, that's funny, man. Uh, but uh, that, that's just a, a cool uh, sort of side effect. Uh, because m celebrities, when I encounter them, we talk about guitars. A lot of them, they're just tools. You know, a lot of them are not geared nerds. As, as no, 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 yeah. no, no. Uh, I mean, I've had a couple encounters where you have to explain to the celebrity why somebody wants that guitar. I was, I was selling a famous guitar player two years ago, a Les Paul. And I said, do you like standards or customs? And he goes, I don't know what the difference is. And he wasn't a dumb guy, just no one had ever told him this. And he goes, and I said, well, these, you know, have a rosewood and this has an ebony fretboard. And he goes, well, I just call them Ace Freely headstocks, th this up here. So that's called binding. And he goes, oh, well, no one's ever told me. He goes, I like those. <laughs> and oh, so yeah. he goes, I'll, I'll take that. That's it. So he, uh, well, I think I can say this. The celebrity that was here recently uh -huh. said that he had a Les Paul custom when he was told he should be playing Les Paul. And Joe Walsh literally said, no, no, you need to play a standard because the frets make it easier to spin strings. Yeah. Before that, he didn't know the difference between the, you yeah. know, uh, but he does now. Uh, I. I can't say the name of the celebrity, but this is a classic of the celebrity looking at an aged guitar, which we had joined to do this project through our artist relations on his bus, held the guitar and went, what's all them scratches on there for? And I looked across the bus to our artist relations and I said, well, that's our whole sort of look of aging because you know right your guitar people know have been on the road all these years and he goes hell it got looking like that i stripped yeah. that all off there yeah why would somebody want that we go well you know because that image of you playing that guitar all those years you know a picture of you on the cover album cover and they're too close to it yeah, yeah. that's it yeah and he goes man 
no, I, I, took, I took all that off there. He said, I always loved a Gretsch guitar. He said, I went to the hardware store and got some of that. Uh, I said, stain? He goes, yeah, and I wiped it on there. <laughs> and I explained how he had a guy paint some motorcycles, come over and spray some clear on it. Yeah. And I'm thinking, we're getting off track here. <laughs> <laughs> But it, it was beautiful because he did not have the attitude of, hey, well, that's my guitar. I want it to be just like my guitar. Right. And just it was tool, just a tool. a tool. Yeah. And he explained the other guitars he had, like that we'd be interested in that, a 335. Mm -hmm. Well, no, they just really want your... I said, that would be like Babe Ruth if you were re reproducing the bat, the weight and the length. And right. handle size of the bat he hit the 60 first home run 60th right and him going well i play golf too you know right. well nobody wants nobody wants your golf clubs. clubs yeah they want that bat yeah and uh it, it is cool to see that these guys are too close to it uh i think i heard peter green say he never liked his last ball because it wasn't the neck wasn't the same as yeah. the one he had felt that clapton had yeah and uh, yeah, you want to go, well, you made the most of it. Yeah. You made it work, for sure. Him and Gary Moore. Yeah. And now Kirk Emmett. So. Uh, yeah, yeah. Kind of cool. Imagine that. Uh, I loved that guitar. The first time I ever heard Fleetwood Mac and that sound and the songs. And uh, another guitar player put a gold top. Yes. Uh, but he had a burst, too, because oh. there are videos of him playing a burst and Peter Green, I think uh, Peter Green playing a Strat too, yeah. and uh, that was crazy, man. Three guitar players, killer, great stuff. I talked to Carlos Santana's brother one time about. I thought that Carlos might have been influenced by. Well, of course he was. Right. Black Magic Woman. What can you say? Just the, the eerie sound right. that Fleetwood Mac could have on those minor key songs, you know. Right. Uh, and then uh, the Allman Brothers, you're going, they had to have listened to Fleetwood Mac. So uh, I, I tell young guys here, especially because they're all younger than me, yeah. that you should have been there, man, <laughs> in real time. In real time. I saw it happen. Yeah. I saw them live. Very cool. I went to see Derek and the Dominoes, and the opening act didn't show up, but they go, but straight from Woodstock Mountain, and Leslie West walks out with, with a junior, with a junior, and I went, <laughs> proceeds to kill. Who is this? Yeah, I saw Leslie West. I'd never heard of him before. Yeah, and uh, and you think about all the sounds, the different sounds, the different guitars. That's why we all want one of each of those guitars. I want one of those, and I want one of those, and I want one of those. Because every time you see somebody, you go, oh, no, now I want one of those. Right. Uh, and uh, you, those people, literally the, those artists, are few in number now. And uh, I'm meeting one here recently that is older than you ever would have imagined them being, but still great. Right. Uh, and uh, I have a friend who is a rock and roll artist, pretty well known. When we're in Dallas at the show, he can't walk 15 feet. People stop and want to get a picture. And uh, he's not as old as me, but I said to him fairly recently, I said, dude, here's the way I see it. If you're known for playing rock, classic rock from that period of time, if you don't, if you're not about seventy, you don't have any credibility, right? Because if you're not, if you're fifty-five years old, you were you weren't even born then, and uh, and, so, and if you look at the Stones, man, and you've read long ago that they just wanted to be old blues artists, right? They admired all those old Chicago blues artists. Going to go see him in Houston coming up. Really? Yeah. Well, I think Keith has achieved his goal of becoming an old blues guy. And uh, 
it's really cool to see. I mean, what can you say about them? They, they have done what they wanted to do. Yeah. And, uh, and, and the guitars have revolved around Keith. And then when Mick Taylor was in a band with that Les Paul and that sound. And Jones with the birds. Yes. Yeah. So. Uh, I mean, Keith with the burst on Ed Sullivan. That's a lot of people's first encounter with Sunburst Les that Paul. Faction. Burst with the Bigsby. Yep. Now, I heard a story about Les Paul playing at his normal gig and Mick and Keith being at the gig a long time ago. Right. And they got to go backstage, and they were talking to Les and said, I mean, I know I read this somewhere, where Keith said his guitars were very, really popular overseas. And Les was going, really? He goes, yeah, everybody wants one of your Les Pauls over in England. Which led Les to say to Gibson, and that was 68, so they thought, well, they want the, the one with the single cutaway with the, and because you got to wonder where the reissues came right. from or what inspired it. Uh, you could but, buy a new one for yeah, almost a decade. Sure. Right. But if you think about where the music came from, England, I've always said, gave us back the blues. Right. right. They appreciate it. They heard it from a cult, totally different perspective. Where I grew up in Illinois, you weren't going to see it. You weren't even going to know it existed. Now, all the sailor ports and... My yeah, record. that's so. that's what it was, and uh, they met over what, what a Muddy Waters record or something. Right. Well, they Ian Stewart and uh, they executed it, and we heard it. Wow, yeah, I mean everything from the Beatles really, but Stones for sure, and uh, and then they were playing Gibson guitars. They were playing Les Pauls and three thirty fives and three thirties. And making that music with it. Can, and why you, did, can you heavy H that door? Yeah, really. <laughs> what is the deal? <laughs> We've tried to spit shine this building, but <laughs> I've never heard that door do that before. It yeah. is all the time. Yeah. <laughs> we'll run that one through the planer later on. Yeah, so yeah but <laughs> duct tape or something. Sure. <laughs> uh, you know, we used to laugh at, at the old plant, at the USA plant. That uh, on a machine, uh, you know, uh, someone sort of start to get off and go, three more layers of masking tape. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, I was on a on a tour one time with some folks, and uh, the gentleman was very talkative, and he was doing the necks while he was doing it, and he kept talking. I go, man, that's going to be a '60s neck on that. Yeah, one. <laughs> <He> just, <laughs> yeah right. Uh, it's amazing how much is still hand done. It is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, we have some amazing technology right. here. We have a that, plug machine in our show, which y'all use. And so, oh God, and really? Yeah. I met Joe Glazer when I lived here and just, we just, wanted, oh, yeah. we wanted to, you know, whenever we were able to get one, we got, we got one a few years ago and it's been well, amazing. Well, uh, actually Joe called me last week because Joe and I go way back. Yeah. We were in a band together. Whoa. Yes. Country band. Uh, and he called me, Joe was brilliant by the way. Yes and said that Pleck wanted to give a consultant of theirs who had made a major contribution to a design or something, they wanted to give him a 335. And did he know anybody at Gibson? So he called me. So I, right now, have traced it down to, I think I have to get with our international, what is Lee in the England? He's a, his title's changed. I can't remember exactly. What Vice President is. UK. <laughs> no, he's he he he's been here with British right. celebrities. Mm -hmm. So he's a contact for that. Right. And actually, the person they want to give it to is in Berlin, and they're in Berlin. Right. And uh, so we're probably going to try to push that over to them in terms he's of making. Of oh, really? Cool. There you go. And. Uh, but that's what the guy wants is three thirty five, right? You know, and uh, uh, It'd be cool to get him one. Yeah, and the the deal is about the plec that on, on on its own. As I saw Joe do it way back, right? Went dang, and the number of times that I've that I've put sharpie on top of all the frets, tried to level them all till they're all, and hope the neck I had adjusted correct. Forget all that. Yeah. That we're way past that. 
So to be able to utilize it here on our product, great. And I just saw the kids, I can't help calling them the kids, out here in neck prep, uh, there, there's a new girl and she was really down into her work, you know, on the roll in the binding. And I stopped her to tell her how important that is. Right. I said, I don't mean to freak you out, but if a person can't see the guitar, he can feel it. Right. And so that, that's one of the most important things we do here. No pressure. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah. But to have that and to, and to commit to it, yeah. you know We're what I mean? on you. <laughs> yeah, right, <laughs> right. Uh, but that's the thing about it too. You add that little touch, and then, especially to our stuff, because if a guitar can't feel like it looks, it's not the same. Right. I've said that all along that, uh, you know, w with our new acoustic, I can talk all about it and how impressed I am with them and everything else. Why don't I just hand you the guitar and you play it and then you tell me about it. Right. You tell me what you think you're hearing and feeling. Uh, what, what I love about it is I've been able to do this for 30 years, luckily, but you really don't. I mean, as far as walking in the store, maybe 10 vintage J45 has actually walked in the stores mm -hmm. I've been in over the years. Probably she can go out and hunt and find them, but it's hard to get two or three or four of them in the same room and, and to mm -hmm. play them. And so and they all have stories and they all got yeah, yeah. Elmer's glue popsicle sticks sure. holding them together half the time. And so it's just cool to be able to, you know, buy a vintage sounding guitar that's that's awesome. structurally sound nowadays. Because acoustic guys, especially if they're aficionados, can be real discriminating because it's got to be there or it's not. Right. You can't coax it out of a guitar that doesn't have it. Well, this happened last Saturday. That one of the guys that say it in sales at the garage in the acoustic room said, yeah, it's going great, man. The, the, the product is great. He said he has a customer that is from uh, Brazil, I believe, and but was in the States at the time uh, doing business, very, very rich, and was traveling around. While he traveled, he was buying guitars. And that he bought a J45, right. Murphy Lab. Well, before I left that afternoon, the guy came in. And I was talking with one of the sales guys there. He goes, are you Tom? He introduced himself and he had a, a son of Jumbo, Murphy Lab. He was strumming on it. He said, I just bought this guitar. He said, I just played three vintage J45s in Chicago. Right. And, and he bought a Murphy Lab J45. Right. And he said, I think I'm gonna sell all my old guitars. He wasn't serious, but what he meant was he's hooked. Right. And that Southern Jumbo that he had in his hand that day, killer. Right. And he, he said, usually I can take six hours to, to decide to buy a guitar. He Hit said, I played one chord and he bought Boom. it. Yeah. I mean, that's testimony to, to you know, like I said, I don't have to talk about them anymore. Just go play them right. and, you'll, and you'll see. And that's what I'm so... Well, I said proud of. I don't, I don't make that happen. They sent two guitars from Montana a few years ago and said, hey, do do your thing. What, what, what? What's my thing? This is an acoustic guitar. And I have a 52 J45, so I use it as a pattern on the J45, and I had J200. And I painted them and then did the Murphy Lab treatment and went, wow, these things sound great. Right. So that became the uh, foundation and so then when we discuss the aging because the j45 i did is pretty beat well we can't do that readily every day they didn't have a, have a staff and one of our just awesome wonderful assets uh madison up in uh, montana he uh took the reins on the murphy lab and he put it together and consulted with me and we talked, Matt Kaler, product development, and myself, and Madison one day about the aging or distressing treatment. And we got to keep it at a minimum. That's not what this whole thing's about. Right. I don't want people talking about how Murphy's scratching up acoustics now. That's not it. So you see the typical pick wear, sound hole, pick guard wear. But I don't want anybody even to look at that. Right. I want them to just strum the guitar. And so far, that seems like how it's going. So anyway, 
Well, great, man. You, um, we'll turn off the cameras and, and go see the lab if that's yeah, cool. That's awesome. Yeah, man. Hey, thank you so much, Tom. Good um, seeing you. Yeah.